So let me go ahead and I'm going to go and share my screen right now. And I am going to share the NORAC book. So let me know when you can see my screen. Yeah, we can see it. Awesome. All right, so this right here is the NORAC book. The NORAC rules stand for the Northeast Operating Rules Advisory Committee. That's what NORAC stands for. But before we get to NORAC, we're going to go a little bit back into your government lessons in school, which I know you're thinking, what? So how many of you, I, it's not really the best forum actually for me to ask how many of you, but I'm just going to assume that many of you are familiar with Congress and the three branches of government, etc. So with all of that, we have Congress makes all of these rules, and those rules are, you know, Congress is the ultimate legislative authority. But what Congress can also do is they have the ability to delegate their lawmaking authority to the executive branch, which they do in something known as Chevron deference. And they do that quite a bit, which is how they tell the FRA that the FRA, which is the Federal Railroad Administration, or any, or in any sort of government administration, like the EPA, for example, could make rules is essentially they go ahead and say, we are Congress, we are authorizing you, executive agency, to do this and to carry out the rulemaking authority that is had by Congress. And in turn, Congress sets, or rather the uh, authority, such as the Federal Railroad Administration, goes ahead and they make a set of rules. And those rules are codified in what's known as the Code of Federal Regulations, or CFR. And what the CFR is, is essentially a set of rules that governs everything in daily life. Anything that has not been passed by Congress that is a regulation that carries the full force of law is listed in the Code of Federal Regulations. And what railroads have to do is abide by all of these rules, but obviously impose a lot of other rules. And what they do is they take those rules that are written by the FRA and adopt them into one of two main books in the United States. It's typically known as NORAC and GCOR. NORAC stands for the Northeast Operating Rules Advisory Committee, which is the book that you see on my screen. The other is the GCOR, which is the General Code of Operating Rules. In general, not part of the fun, anything west of the Mississippi uses the GCOR book. Anything in the Northeast uses the NORAC book. Anything in the South also uses GCOR. GCOR is less prescriptive, but it also has more flexibility, which is why it's more widely adopted outside of the Northeast. So within the confines of that, they go ahead and publish this rule book known as the Book of NORAC Operating Rules. And this rule book is the rule book that is used for every single one of these railroads on this cover sheet. The ones that you'll most likely notice are Amtrak. This is the rule book used by Amtrak in the Northeast. It is the rule book used by SEPTA, New Jersey Transit, the MBTA commuter rail. There are portions of other, freight, lots of freight carriers operate over it. Lots of short line railroads as well as um, uh, scenic tourist railroads operate under the NORAC book. The NORAC book is the main book for the Northeast in terms of operating rules. And so what you'll notice in this book is this book has a bunch of rules about everything to very prescriptive things in what to do in certain circumstances. So we're going to go a little bit into the way in which rules are written and structured, as well as some of the rules related to signals, which is how we communicate those rules to the field. So the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to go through the rule book, and we're going to go to rule number 122. So rule 122, if I go to rule 122, let me at that, or not at that. Control F, Rule 122. Would someone like to read the entirety of Rule 122 aloud for us? No one? All right, I'll, All read, right, it. I'll read it. Okay, go ahead. Trains must not make unscheduled stops to receive or discharge passengers or employees without authorization from the dispatcher. Awesome. So that's our rule. The NORAC book right there has just told us that we cannot stop anywhere that is unscheduled to pick up or discharge passengers or employees without the dispatcher's authorization. 
Is that the rule that applies to every railroad in the Northeast? Kind of. So, that is the rule in the NORAC book, which if you go to any conductor in the Northeast and ask them what rule 122 is, it's going to be something related to unscheduled stops. But sometimes the railroad wants to say that, you know, you can make unscheduled stops at certain locations. For example, at an employee yard to pick up passengers, or not passengers, rather employees, who might be working at certain locations. The way that you would do that is you need to amend the rule. And the way that you amend the rule is with something known as your employee timetable and special instruction. So the employee timetable and special instructions is a document published by every single commuter railroad, regardless of whether you're a NORAC book railroad or a G-Core railroad. And what your special instructions do is they modify the rules that are written in the NORAC book. So the way in which it's written, and I'll give an example of, you know, in Boston is one example, is there's a train yard where certain trains are allowed to stop. So the way that you would make that authorization is you would go ahead and you would issue in your special instructions rule 122-S1, which stands for special instruction 1 to rule 122. And that says that when you're operating under the authority of, in this case, the railroad in Boston, it allows you, it overwrites Rule 122 or amends it by providing certain special instructions. The example being, it would say that you are allowed to stop at the train yard on certain trains, etc. But are we done there? No. The reason being is that the special instructions are written in a document that is typically published once every three years. But all kinds of conditions on the railroad change all the time. So what then happens is they publish something known as the bulletin, or rather the summary bulletin, which is typically issued on the first Monday of every month. And that document tells you all of the changes to the rules in not just the NORAC book, but the changes to the special instructions that have taken effect since the timetable went into effect. So in other words, it could be two years, but your summary document tells you all of the changes to the special instructions in the main document. So again, we have the FRA governs rules, we write the NORAC book, then from the NORAC book we make our special instructions that relate just to us, and then we can modify them with our bulletin orders from the summary bulletins. But the summary bulletins, I said, only come out once a month. So what about more frequently? Well, that's the concept of a supplemental bulletin. So the supplemental bulletins can come out at any time, and those are bulletin orders that are in addition to the summary bulletin, which means if I wanted to see what the current rule is regarding employee stops, I, as a conductor, have to know to check Rule 122 in the NORAC book, know that book's rule. Then I have to check my special instructions to find Rule 122S1 to find the special instructions that apply to our railroad for that particular rule. Then I have to check all of my most, I have to check my most recent summary bulletin to see has there been any change since the beginning of this month to that rule, or rather from the beginning of the timetable to the beginning of the month to that rule. Then I have to check all my supplemental bulletins to see if there have been any changes to rule 122 since the beginning of the month. And all of that is a regular process that happens all the time, except we haven't even gotten to TSRVs and Form Ds. Temporary Speed Restriction Bulletins and Form Ds are individual rules that are issued to a particular train that allow them to bypass the rules in the rule book, typically if like there's a signal failure, etc. So the book prescribes all of the rules that relate to if there is a signal failure, what you have to do. For example, Rule 241 tells you the rules related to passing a stop signal that you're not normally authorized to pass, for example, if there's a signal issue. 241S1 tells you how your railroad governs it. 241S1 in any of your bulletins would provide an updated version of Rule 241 as contained in the special instructions. Any questions on this thus far? I know it's kind of confusing, but it's basically just following down the logical order of documents to get the most recent version of the rule. 
Am I nod? Yes? No? Yes? I see thumbs up? All right. So on top of all of that, there's then the notion of line-specific special instruction. So we talked about the book of special instructions, but now how do I tell my conductors and engineers that the speed limit on a certain section of track is limited to 20 miles an hour, for example? That would be a line-specific special instruction. So in addition to my special instructions, I also have a section of them that gives me the special instructions related to every commuter rail line wherever I am, or a freight line, for example, that tells me that in this segment of track on this line, the speed is this. And again, that can be superseded as well by any of the bulletin orders. So again, bulletin orders, NORAC, we have NORAC book, special instructions, line-specific special instructions, and all of those can be superseded by a bulletin order or a summary bulletin order. Now, on top of all of that, let's talk about one thing that's a very common thing in the Northeast. SEPTA Regional Rails, Paoli, Thorndale, Wilmington, Newark, and Trenton lines run on Amtrak lines. The MBTA Commuter Rails Providence line runs on Amtrak's line. The MBTA Commuter Rail Northside lines, with the exception of the Ingrid Rockport lines, spend their further parts operating over Pan Am Railway's freight tracks. In all of those cases, the commuter rail or freight railroad who is in charge of those tracks is their book. So in other words, it's my house, you play by my rules. Which means, say that you're a SEPTA conductor, you have to know the SEPTA special instructions to the NORAC book, and all the special instructions and bulletin orders related to the SEPTA book, but the second you go onto an Amtrak controlled line, suddenly the SEPTA rules only apply if they are more restrictive than the Amtrak rules. The Amtrak rules apply now for anything you do on Amtrak's tracks, which means you have to know both rules and know which is more restrictive at any given time. Which means, again, now, in addition to having to manage and maintain your NORAC book, all of your special instructions, and all your bulletins and supplemental bulletins for SEPTA, you have to do that for Amtrak as well to know all of their changes to their rules and be able to flip back and forth to know what rule applies based on exactly where you are and who is controlling that particular track. Any questions on that thus far? No. I see the chat, which I realized I had not been monitoring, so I just want to open that up. Um, so, yes. So anyway, that's the, uh, that's the basic notion of how you have bulletin orders and your supplemental bulletins that all go ahead modifying the rules. But again, like I mentioned, you have to know what the restrictive is. So if there's a particular rule that says, you know, you are limited to do... Uh, to say trains cannot exceed 50 miles an hour when doing this special procedure, but the Amtrak book says 60 miles an hour, guess what? Even if you're a SEPTA train on an Amtrak track, you still have to abide by your more restrictive 50 mile an hour rule. Conversely, if you were on a track that your rules say 50, but their rules, or your rules say 60 and their rules say 50, you still have to abide by the more restrictive rule because it's their track. So the rule of thumb is it's always the most restrictive of whichever the most current rule in effect per the supplemental bulletins, modifying the summary bulletins, modifying the special instructions for lines, modifying the overall special instructions, modifying the NORAC rules. But where NORAC comes into play a huge role is that at the end of the day, rule 122 is unscheduled stops, no matter whether you're SEPTA, Amtrak, MBTA, Pan Am Railways, so from all the way to Maine down to D.C., if you're running off of the NORAC book and you ask about Rule 122, that relates to unscheduled stops. So at least it gives you one centralized place to know if we're dealing with unscheduled stops. I can just check Rule 122 in all of my books, and the underlying fundamental rules that are contained in the NORAC book do not change. Any questions on this thus far? No. All right, now we get to get into the other fun part of our crash list course, which relates to signal. So if you hang tight for just a second, I am going to try switching 
uh, rooms on my iPad so that you can do this. And you can see, if you Google NORAC 11th edition, you'll be able to find a PDF of the most recent version of the NORAC book, which will give you all of the rules related to this. But so now what I want to talk about are signals. So let me see if I can get this to work from my iPad to draw some diagrams. So if you hang tight for just a second, let's see here. Um, let me go ahead and see if I can uh, take back control there. Let's go ahead and see if we can start screen sharing. Start button. Let's see if this works. Can you now see my iPad screen? Yes. Yes. Cool. All right. So what we're going to do is we are going to open up a new document. All right. So let me uh, just pull this up over here. So right now what we're going to talk about is going to be some signals. So what we're going to do is we're going to draw a two-track railroad over here. So I'm going to draw our first track over here. And pardon my constantly flipping back as I'm going between the tools on this. So, okay, so this right here are our two tracks. And now I'm going to draw what's known as an interlocking. An interlocking is a set of switches between two tracks. So we're going to call... Interlockings always have bizarre names that have some backstory that only railroaders understand or know. Uh, so we're going to call this one Rona interlocking, and this one is going to be Quar interlocking. Uh, so again, you always have some weird backstory to it that people know. It's also common practice to name interlockings after deceased members of the railroad who have spent a long portion of their career in the operating rules department, uh, which is why, in a very touching tribute, the interlocking outside of when they just upgraded the tracks to uh, where the Patriots play at Gillette Stadium was named in honor of the longtime union president for the commuter rail who passed away suddenly after a heart attack who had season tickets to the past for like 40 years and never missed a game in 40 years. So, you know, that's how these names come about. But so we have these interlockings. And so what I'm going to do is we're going to draw some signals. So the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to put some signals over here at each interlocking. And the reason that we need signals, of course, is to make an easy way to tell people what is going on at each of these places. And I'm going to copy my horrific signal drawing over to QAR interlocking. And we're going to do this over here at RONA. Okay, so here are our interlockings that are signals. So this is what allows us to tell trains whether or not they're allowed to proceed. And we're going to move QAR interlocking down a little bit. But the other thing that we want to have is we want to tell trains about the spacing. So this is going to be something that we'll talk about in a second. I'm going to draw blocks. So what I mean by that is the railroad is divided into a bunch of blocks. So where I draw a green line is essentially a segment of track on the railroad that is electrically separated from each other, which means that I know whether or not a train is here. I don't know if this train is at this end of the block. I don't know if it's at this end of the block. I just know that it is somewhere on this track between these two points. And vice versa, I can figure it out over here, over here, etc. That's what the notion of blocks are. Now, there are three main types of track, track types within a NORAC railroad. And those are rule... 251 track, 261 track, and 562 track, which we will talk about in just a second. So, what this means is, first of all, we have something known as our interlocking signals, which are these signals over here. And I'm going to draw a train over here that's going to be heading this way. So there's our train. 
and we're going to say hi to our train. Our train is currently heading, if I say that uh, this is north, our train is currently heading east on the number two track at Rona Interlock. Now, what I need to do, here's an important thing. We're going to say that the track is clear over here. Okay? And we're going to go back in just a second. Um, sound, oh, sorry, there's some background noise there. So this right over here, we'll say this track over here is clear for a train heading that way. So now, if a train is clear there, what this means, if I have another train over here, is that train can proceed through the interlocking and continue on its merry way. Now, if I need to prevent the train from hitting into the train ahead of it, right now, with no, with no signals between the interlocking, this train has to stop. Because it doesn't know, there's no way for me to say, once you've passed Rona, where that next train is to prevent it from hitting a new e So that's where the notion of an automatic signal comes into play. So what an automatic signal does, whoops, is it tells us the status of continuing forward. So what I mean by that, and I'm going to draw these over here, is, if I just copy this, if I draw this, what this does is this tells me how the train is permitted to proceed. So here now, with my signals in here, I can tell the train that it can keep on going. It just has to stop to prevent hitting into the train here. So what I would typically do is I would want to leave a space. So we'll have this as our little space which means I need the train to stop here. So this signal will be set to stop. Kind of. We'll come back to that in a second. This signal over here, I need to tell it that it's allowed to go, but I need it to be able to stop by the next signal, which means I'm going to make this signal something known as an approach signal. What an approach signal tells me is that I'm allowed to proceed forward, but I must be prepared to stop at the next signal. And over here, we'll give this as a clear signal. So what this tells me is that I can continue on a clear signal here. Then I hit this signal. And this signal tells me that, whoa, I have to be prepared to stop at the next signal. So then I go slower and pull up here, where I then have to stop at my stop signal. Now, there's two things that we're going to talk about with this. The first is, I mentioned 251, 261, and 562. In 251 territory, these automatic signals only exist in one direction of traffic, which means if this was 251 up here, I would have a signal for each of the trains heading westbound here, but I would not have one for a train heading eastbound, which means a train heading westbound, in this case, figure that my train is going the other way, would just be able to get all the granularity that we have on the other way. But if I'm heading eastbound, once I pass the signal at Rona, the next signal that I get is not until far interlocking, which means I have to keep this entire section of track open as opposed to being able to space trains more compact if I have signals in both directions, which is what 261 track is, which is what we have on the track on the bottom where the signals go in both directions. What is 562 track? 562 is actually a quite unique thing compared to 251 and 261 because instead of having signals at each of these sort of blocks, there's a little transponder in the ground. And that transponder tells a little console on the in the sort of operating compartment of the, uh, of the train, saying, the signal that you would have seen aside the train is this, but we're just going to show it on your train, which is beneficial for a couple different reasons. The first is, instead of having to remember what the last signal you passed was, it now shows it for you the entire time that you're operating until you pass your next cab signal. The second benefit is that because you don't have to maintain the infrastructure 
for putting out all of these signals and managing the light bulbs and everything, it allows you to be able to put more of these blocks in there for more granularity. And we're seeing, especially with positive train control, more and more trains are moving to running with 562 territory as opposed to 261, which was formerly the more common of the two. But I kind of lied here because I told you that this signal over here, which I'm going to highlight in green, I told you that this signal was stopped. I lied. It's really a stop and proceed signal. And the reason for that is this. If this train is operating on this track and it comes up to this signal right at the stop, really there's nothing that's going to impact that train aside from the train ahead of it. So it can keep on going just as long as it doesn't hit the train ahead of it. And that gives rise to the notion of what's known as a stop and proceed signal, which is the most restrictive signal you can get for any of these automatic signals. So what the stop and proceed signal tells you is that you must stop, but then you are allowed to proceed at restricted speed. Does anyone want to take a guess as to what restricted speed is? It's in the book somewhere. It is in the book somewhere. So I can't easily flip back to the book. But normally most people would think that restricted speed is like a speed limit, like 15 miles. No. Restricted speed is a method of operation, which is officially no more, not exceeding 20 miles an hour outside of interlocking limits, not exceeding 15 miles an hour within interlocking limits, not, exceed, not exceeding the posted track speed, and being able to stop within one half of your line of sight short of any obstruction, stop signal, uh, defective track, etc. Which means, in our case here, this train will be allowed to come to the stop signal, stop, and then afterwards, it is allowed to proceed not exceeding the lesser of 20 miles an hour or the posted track speed for that track. And it can proceed at whatever speed so long as it can stop within half of the locomotive engineer's line of sight until it comes up on the train behind it. Now, let's talk about this signal and what makes it different. Say that the switch was not lined properly and the train is coming down this way. If it passes this signal, what could happen? It could come on this end, bam, derailment, which is the big difference between a home signal and an interlocking and an automatic signal. These signals are, that I'm going to highlight in, let's say, yellow, are what are known as home signals, interlocking signals, or absolute signals. Because when they are stopped, you absolutely cannot pass them without the risk of derailing. These signals, the one I highlighted in green, but really any of these signals, are what are known as automatic signals. Because they, as long as you don't pass them at, uh, rather, as long as you pass them at restricted speed, the only possible risk you have is an obstruction on the track you're on which as long as you can stop within half your line of sight, you're fine. Which means dispatchers do not have any control over these signals. These signals are 100% automatic based on where the trains are and the status of the interlocking signals that the dispatchers do control. So the train dispatcher can say that this track is clear at Quar and this track is clear at Rona. So the dispatcher controlled ones are these purple ones here. Once the dispatcher has done that, the automatic signals will automatically set this signal to approach and this signal to stop because it knows there's a train ahead and knows what the proper spacing is and the signals downstream. So with all of that said, there's all of this. Now, you've probably seen a bunch of things like this, but there's an approach signal, there's a clear signal. What about a different type of signal? We're now going to talk about the medium clear signal. So a medium clear signal is a signal that you would expect to see mostly at an interlocking. So over here, say that this signal was medium clear. What a medium clear signal tells you is that you are clear to proceed 
on the track ahead, or actually, you know what, I'm going to swap this for a second. We're going to make this signal stop, and the medium clear signal is going to go on the number one track. And when we do this, what this tells us is that the track ahead is clear, which it is, if I'm switching tracks. So let's say that the dispatch is set it so that I'm switching tracks like that. What the medium clear signal tells me is that I would normally have a clear signal here, but I'm switching tracks. And because I'm switching tracks, I need to proceed through the interlocking, this set of switches, at what's known as medium speed, which in our case is 30 miles an hour. So what this medium clear signal tells us is that I'm allowed to go 30 miles an hour through this set of switches, and once I exit the interlocking limits over here, I'm back to being able to proceed as though I'm on a clear signal. Now, does that all make sense? Nods? Yes? No? Yes? Okay. So that's the notion of a medium clear signal. But as we've already seen, we can't just have a stop signal because the trains need a long bit of spacing to be able to stop. So in order for me to tell the crews that I'm coming up on a medium clear signal, I need to have a signal over here. And this signal is not going to be a, what do we typically have to warn people that they are coming up on a, on a stop signal? We give them an approach signal. Does anyone want to take a guess as to what aspect we would see at this signal before the medium clear? So we warn people of a restriction by giving them an approach right beforehand. How do you think we warn them that they are approaching a speed restriction of medium speed? We want to tell them that they are approaching a medium speed restriction. Does someone want to take a guess as to what it might be if you're approaching a medium speed restriction? A medium clear? No. This is a medium clear. The, we're approaching a medium clear. So we're approaching something that will require us to be at medium speed. You want to take one more guess, Austin? We're approaching medium speed. An approach signal? Uh, an approach, approaching medium speed. Uh, uh, what signal? An approach medium signal. So this would be an approach medium signal telling us that we are approaching the next signal. We need to approach the next signal at medium speed because that tells us that I can slow my train down in time to medium speed to then go through this set of switches at which point I'm then clear after I go through the set of switches. Now, to make things more confusing, there's the notion of an approach medium and a medium approach, which are absolutely not the same thing. An approach medium signal tells you that you need to approach the next signal at medium speed. A medium approach signal is essentially a medium clear signal plus an approach signal. So what that would be is that if I had a train, let's say, stop, let's say I had a train over here, and this is going to be my state, then this signal would be a stop signal. And a train that's over here that's going to be switching like so up to this track, this signal that it would get would be a medium approach. Because this tells me that I can, much like my medium clear, I have to go medium speed through the interlocking but afterwards, I'm not clear to proceed. I have a stop signal immediately thereafter. So that's the big difference between an approach medium and a medium approach. Approach medium tells you that you need to approach the next signal prepared to go the speed in the name, whereas a medium approach tells you that you must go medium speed to the interlocking and you must approach the next signal prepared to stop. So it's this combination of terms and it's the same for medium speed, limited speed, which is 40. Under the NORAC book, limited speed is 45, medium speed is 30, slow speed is 15. So I could have a slow approach, a medium approach, a limited approach. 
I could have an approach limited, an approach medium, an approach slow, a slow clear, a limited clear, etc. That's how you tell trains what speed they're allowed to go when they're switching tracks, as well as the speed they are allowed to, they must be prepared to travel at once they continue. I'm now going to switch back to the NORAC book, which, okay, you being able to get all of that. The next big thing is being able to get, let's see, you see my screen yet? Nope, it looks like it's Yeah, we see the book. Cool. So back in the book, we talked about all these different rules. So let's go now to see the rule for clear. So here are those cab signals that I was talking about and what they look like. But let's go to a clear signal. Okay, so this right here, see rule 281? All of these signals that you could see in the field mean the exact same thing, clear. So you have to know every single one of these potential ways that it could show and know the rule associated for it. So for example, if we wanted to say, here's a good example of approach limited. All of these 281B rules, the diagonal line with the bottom straight line blinking, or this of a yellow over a blinking green, all mean that you must approach, all mean approach limited, rather, which is approach the next signal at medium speed. This right here would then be, or rather, I'm sorry, this is blinking, which is limited, approach limited, and this is then a limited clear. We have down here is then an approach medium signal in all of those different forms. We have here is a medium clear signal. These are some special ones that are seldom used, a medium approach medium and a medium approach slow, which is a medium approach plus an approach slow or a medium approach plus an approach uh, medium at the exact same point. This right here would be an approach slow. Uh, so again, all these different signals, meaning all the same thing, which is the legacy of the various railroads that all have their different books. So this all comes from the Pennsylvania Railroad, which used to use these A-type signals. The New Haven Railroad, which ran from New Haven to Boston, used to use the C-type signals. So these are what you see going New Haven to Boston. Uh, the A signals have been replaced by the B and double A signal, or rather the B signals, which are essentially the same as the A signals, but they're colored. So notice if you take a look at any of the A signals and the B signals, so like, where, let me get a good color example over here. Uh, if we go over here, yeah, see how the A signal is a horizontal line and the bottom aspect is a vertical line? And then the C signal is a red lamp over a green lamp. The B signal is just a combination of the two. So it's a red horizontal line and a green vertical line. They mean the same thing independently, the red and green versus the horizontal over vertical. It's just a consolidation of the two. The A1 and the AA ones are the smaller type signals that you might see in certain places. The C4 signals you see um, in a handful of New Jersey transit cases, but you see them a lot around Boston. The D signals you really only see, those are former CSX railroad signals, which you typically see in outside of Baltimore and in Washington, D.C. at Union Station. Those are really the big cases where you see the D-type signal. So that is about the fastest I have ever gone through the crashless course in operating rules. Uh, we have a couple minutes left for questions. I will now open it up to any questions you may have. That was a very, very, very fast crashless course, but hopefully it was valuable. So any questions you might have, I'm happy to answer. can be about signals, can be about bulletins and operating rules, qualification, which for those who don't know, anyone who is a railroad conductor must fully draw a map from memory of every track, every switch, every speed restriction, every signal type, every signal location, give the mile post of the signals, 
give uh, the name and milepost of any road crossing, give anywhere where there's an electric lock switch, which is like a switch to an old freight branch, uh, all of that they must draw a map from memory before they are allowed to be a certified conductor operating over that given segment of track. And they have to know it for every line they operate over. For example, the Long Island Railroad gives their conductors a blank map of Long Island, and they have to draw every switch, every signal, every interlocking, every everything for the entirety of Long Island before they can be a conductor. So there's a lot more that you need to know before you can be an official conductor. Questions? Have I scared you? Are you like, I learned something, but now I have way more questions? So, now's your time to ask them. Do you have to have a rule by number? by number? Or just or by, just like, by what like, what it means? Typically, you have to know it by number. Uh, some rules you don't, but many of them are referred to by their number. So, for example, permission to proceed past the stop signal is a 241, which is referred to as, like, if I came up at a stop signal and it was a home signal that I couldn't pass, I would radio the dispatcher and be like, why are you keeping me here? Oh, I gave that signal however long ago. Didn't you see the clear signal? No, it hasn't come through yet. Okay, quote, I'm going to give you a 241, which then follows a very highly specific documented process of them reading back, them blocking things off on their end, giving a particular set of rules and reading verbatim from a script, authorizing them to proceed past the stop signal on the number one track, front at milepost, whatever, interlocking, whatever, train number, whatever, with engine number, whatever. Uh, it has permission to proceed past whatever in the whatever direction. And then the locomotive engineer has to repeat back verbatim what was just said, and if there's any discrepancy, they have to start over and try the process again. Only at that point can they proceed going down the track. So, yes, you typically have to know them by number from that perspective. Other questions? No? I'm going to take that to mean that you are either bored to tears or very much uh, enjoying it and tired now. Uh, with that said, it is now 3 p.m., so it is time for the afternoon hangout. So what's going to happen now is we have 12 tables available like you've seen throughout the day. Feel free to grab a table and just hang out with any of, you know, any of the people you met today, open discussion. Text your friends who you might know who are here. Tell them all to meet up at a certain table. If you didn't know anyone here but you want to just talk with some others, feel free to hop around, bounce through the tables. This is really meant to be our equivalent of a happy hour, 3 p.m., so if you want to have a drink as well, that's totally fine. But, yeah, so you're more than welcome to, uh, to come on and go ahead and join any of the tables. But aside from that, I also hope not just this session that you had a wonderful day here at Transportation Camp Virtual, I can tell you that we start planning this literally the, on the calendar. The first planning meeting for Transpo Camp Philly 2021 is scheduled for two weeks from today. We start planning this way in advance and meet at least once every other month throughout the summer until we get ready to go. So it's a lot of planning that goes into this. And uh, we hope you had a wonderful, um, a wonderful time from there. So sorry, just one second. Um, Hold on, I just have to take care of one bit of business um, to tell them to, uh, hold on, tell, uh, tell your people to mingle through the tables, I think. Okay, yeah, uh, thank you again for coming. We hope you had a wonderful day and enjoyed the best version of Transpo Campus we could have in this, you know, forum. But hopefully you learned something, you had some nice dialogues, and it kept you sane despite the social distancing. So thanks, everyone. Take care, and uh, we'll see you at the tables.